Ako biste htjeli s nekim voditi neki važni razgovor, zbog kaosa informacija oko nas možda uopće ne biste znali od kuda započeti. Što je važno? Što je istinito? Što je dirigirano? Što je dobronamirno, a što ne? Zato među važnim razgovorima svoje mjesto sigurno ima razgovor o prirodi zbivanja oko nas. Na temelju premise o centraliziranoj kontroli informacija, financija i odlučivanja, koja nam se predstavlja kao svoja suprotnost. Ukratko, to je ono kad se jedno priča, a drugo radi. To drugo moglo bi biti koračanje, ne baš više niti skriveno prema svjetskoj totalitarnoj državi. O tome ćemo razgovor ne po prvi puta voditi ovdje, na rubu znanosti. Dobro večer, David Ike je autor desetak knjiga u kojima je nastavio prikazati zakulisne postupke i namjere kojima se upravlja svjetskim zbivanjima s određenim ciljem. S obzirom dakle da ono što će sutra postati povijest nastaje na temelju interpretaciji današnjih događaja, minute koje slijede posvetit ćemo o nekoj vrsti revizionizma. Ne toliko povijesnog koliko revizionizma vrlo nega, nedanih događaja kojih svakako ne nedostaje u ovo vrijeme vrlo ubrzanih zbivanja. Dobro večer. Hvala maj. Kada pričamo o situaciji i ubrzanim događajima i kod nas, krenimo od kraja. Kura sve to vodi i ko je zapravo neki zamišljeni cilj zbivanja o ko- koja smatramo, naravno, manipuliranima? Well, what's interesting as we sit here now is that what I've been writing and talking about for the, well, over 20 years now, but nearly 22, is, is coming to a point where it can be clearly seen But it's like everything. Um, if you um, are, are faced with uh, a lot of information, but you don't, if you like, have a sat-nav or a road map, then it can be a series of dots what's going on. But when you see um, a few what I call co- coordinates, suddenly the, these bewildering dots become a tapestry and you can see how they all fit together. And I guess... Uh, The main ones are, first of all, where does this cabal of families and their secret society network that I've been exposing for two decades, where do they want to take the world? Well, it's a simple equation. Um, when there's a few of you and you want to control literally billions more and more fiercely in a much more and more uh, tyrannical way, then you have to centralize decision making. The more points of decision making there are, the more diversity, the less control any central cabal is going to have because there's just too many points to, to have to keep, keep manipulating. So what they set out to do a very, very long time ago is to constantly and incessantly centralize power. And this is going uh, back. Uh, this has not been going for a few decades. We're going back to this process to when humans organize themselves in tribes. And in those days, uh, the people of the tribe decided what happened in the tribe. Then we reached a major uh, stepping stone in this uh, process, where lots and lots of tribes were brought together under what we call nations. Now, a few people at the center of the nation, the country, are now dictating to all the other tribes. And what we've got in Europe, Croatia's not going to join. You're not going to join, are you? Oh, for goodness sake. Um, what we've got in Europe, in the European Union, and, and other unions that they want, they've got an African Union, they want an American Union, a Pacific Union, a Middle East Union, and so on. We have a situation now in Europe where the countries that absorb the tribes are being absorbed by this super state. And thus now, um, at the center of the super state, are a handful of dark-suited uh, bureaucrats, not even elected people, who are dictating to all the former countries who were dictating to all the former tribes. So what we see is this incessant 
centralization of power. We see it not only in politics, but we see it in uh, corporation ownership, in banking ownership, in media ownership. And for a long, long time now, we've had a name for it, uh, globalization. What people call globalization is merely this agenda I've been exposing all this time um, unfolding around the world. So where's it going? Well, ultimately, what they have been working towards is a structure whereby they have a world government which dictates to every country. In fact, in the end, they want to break the countries up into regions. Um, they have a world central bank which dictates all global finance. Um, a, a world currency, which wouldn't be uh, cash, it would be a single electronic currency, the same one for everyone in the world. And, of course, there are massive implications for freedom in, uh, you know, single electronic currencies or electronic currencies in general. Because when you go into a, uh, a, a store or whatever to buy something today um, and you hand over your electronic uh, money, a, a credit card, um, and the computer says no to you, then at least, although it's going out of circulation so fast, at least you can pay cash. Uh, when there is no cash, that computer's deciding uh, above barter whether you purchase or not. That's the idea. Then they want a world army to impose the will of the world government on anyone who doesn't uh, just take the diktats from, from uh, the cabal at the centre, the world government. And we've reached the point now where we have a de facto world government and a de facto world army, which is operating in a de facto way in the way they want this structure to work. I.e., we have a world government under code uh, terms like international community, G8, and all this stuff. And, of course, it's not the international community. It's the United States, uh, Britain, France, Germany... Uh, Israel and this little cabal. It's not a world community at all, but they just call it that. And then what happens, as we've seen in Libya, and as they, they want to do in Syria, and, and of course, too, in Iran, um, uh, they want a situation where the world government would then send the world army in to sort out any country that wasn't playing ball. What if we had this summer now? A situation where the world community, the international community, demonizes people like Gaddafi, demonizes people like Assad, and having done that, they send the boys in. NATO, de facto world army. So we're actually reach, we've actually reached the point now in this process where what they want it, it, it officially with world government, world army names is actually playing out under de, in a de facto way already. And so um, how do they take us there? They take us there by mainly two mass manipulation techniques, not just mental manipulation, but emotional manipulation. The first one I call a long time ago now, problem, reaction, solution, where you want to change the world in a certain way, and you know that if you openly offer that uh, way forward, you're going to get a big reaction against it. People are going to say, what are you doing? What are you doing? So what you do is you don't announce it openly. You play problem, reaction, solution. Stage one, you create a problem. Could be a, a, a financial collapse. It could be a government collapse. It could be uh, a terrorist uh, attack, which you engineer and blame someone else for, like 9/11. Um, and then you tell the public um, through an overwhelmingly unquestioning media um, the version of the problem you want them to believe, i.e., you know, Bin Laden orchestrated 9/11 from a cave in Afghanistan. You know, I hope he had a, a good a battery on his phone. You know. But um, anyway, um, then at stage two, you want uh, the reaction of outrage, of fear, of something must be done. And then you, then, who have created the problem covertly, then um, have got that, rea uh, that, that response, that reaction, do something. You then openly offer the solutions to the problems you've created, which are... Uh, changes in society and changes in legislation and changes in the structure of society and government which advance your agenda of centralization of power. And we have such a wonderful example now in, in our area of the world. Because, um, you see, what I've just described, problem, reaction, solution, 
is why the world has been incessantly, right up to now, constantly bombarded by problems, upheavals, crises, things that don't work. It's a simple, simple explanation why. When you have a situation that works, that is in harmony, that people are happy with, you try telling them you're going to change it. What are you doing? Everything's fine. If it's not broke, don't mend it. Go away. So you have to keep making sure the status quo in whatever area of society we're talking about consistently doesn't work. So what you do is you create a problem to make sure it doesn't work in a certain area. You then get the reaction, which allows you to offer your solution. But the solution's not designed to solve the problem. The, the solution is designed to further centralize power and change society in the way you want it and to go create the next crisis, which you can do the process through, through again. And what we're seeing now in Europe, coldly calculated, mercilessly uh, uh, abusing the people of Europe um, to, to, to advance this agenda is the engineered uh, economic catastrophe in Europe, which is designed, and my goodness me, <laughs> as we sit here, they're saying it already. People like uh, Jose Barroso, uh, who I wouldn't trust to tell me the time in a room full of clocks, by the way, uh, the president of the European Commission. Uh, Herman van Rompuy, uh, the, the president uh, uh, of, of, of Europe, of the European Union, who's never seen a ballot box where anyone from the public put a vote in. Uh, people like Merkel in Germany and Sarkozy in uh, France. They are now using a term they were terrified of using before because they didn't want to frighten the children. Because it's not real. No, no, over the years they've said, no, we're not, we're not trying to create a super state. No, no. Yes, you are. And now they've reached the point where they're saying to solve the economic problems of the European Union, which they have uh, covertly engineered, they must have deep integration in, in, of, of Europe and European countries into this bureaucratic uh, spider's web that we've been manipulated into all these years. And when you consider that now something like 75% of the laws that are introduced in Britain uh, affecting the British people originate in the Commission in Brussels, that's now what on earth are they contemplating in terms of the centralized control of Europe when they talk in terms of deep integration? And then you look at what's happening to the euro. You see, once you understand where they want to take us and the methods used to take us there, the world kind of opens up, becomes an open book. People are saying, oh, big problems with the euro. Yes, because they're supposed to be. You see, the euro is not an end. It's a stepping stone to an end, which is this single electronic world currency. Thus, they were faced with a mass of currencies in Europe. The Deutschmark, the Gilder, um, the, the, the Lira, the Franc. Uh, and they are on their way in their goal to this single electronic currency. And they've got all these currencies that they, they're faced with. So you introduce the euro and you delete all those currencies from countries that have joined the euro in one fell swoop. And now you are a massive step closer to your single electronic currency. So the euro, at some point, I'm not saying tomorrow, but at some point, the, the euro is absolutely going to be crashed uh, so it doesn't work. And when it doesn't work, what are people going to say? Do something. Well, you know, the only way out of this is, is, is an electronic currency, a single electronic currency for the world and all that stuff. And, and in terms of the world central bank uh, that I, I talked about to dictate all global finance, the Vatican's just come out in the last few weeks calling for a world central bank and um, uh, a, a, a global government. George Soros, this, this billionaire financier, an absolute bagman agent for the cabal, not least the House of Rothschild, he's calling for a world central bank. Why? Because of the global economic crash. Who crashed the global economy? The people like Soros and the, and the, the cabal he represents. So all the time we are being uh, manipulated 
by creating crises and then offering the solution to the crises. And just very quickly, the, the one other thing, um, one other technique that is like the stablemate, the bedfellow of problem, reaction, solution, is what I call the totalitarian tiptoe. And that's when you know you're going to Z, but if you go from A to Z in two bigger leaps, then people are going to look up from the game show and the sport event and say what's going on because the change is going to be so blatant. So you go as big, in a bigger leap as you can towards that goal, but not so fast that you alert too many people or not so fast that people start to see that actually these steps are not in isolation. They're actually connected. And that <laughs> brings us back to Europe. The day after I was born, on April the 30th, um, 1952, 60 years ago nearly, the man uh, who is still today called the father of Europe, the father of what became the European Union, a man called Jean Monnet, another front man for the House of Rothschild, he wrote a letter to a friend 60 years ago. And I, in summary, this is what he said. We are going to take the people of Europe into a super state in stages by stealth and each stage along the road we're going to justify further and further integration by economic means and he also uh, points out that that the each uh, each stage of centralization would be promoted as unconnected to all the other stages and so what we've seen if you look at it through um, the decades is the constant centralization of power in Europe uh, to the point now thanks to the Lisbon Treaty it is phenomenal and they want more even more much more um, and they have been using economic means to justify these stages and here we are sitting here today and they're doing precisely that again economic catastrophe in Europe we need to have a European Union Treasury, they're saying now, to dictate the tax and financial policies of every country in Europe, and um, centralization and, and deep integration. It, they're still doing it, and we need to get wise to it, because if we don't, then um, you know, not even our children and grandchildren are gonna live in a, f uh, a fascist nightmare. Um, we, if we have got much time left in our lives, we're going to experience it because it will be there within, within uh, 10 years. And I might even be op being optimistic about that unless we intervene. Danas se čak spominje da se ograničenja državnih proračuna trebaju staviti u ustave, što je isto jedna absurdna ideja s obzirom da ustav ima sasvim drugu funkciju, ali mnogo toga je tu zapravo ironično na prvi pogled kao kad neko daje lekcije iz demokracije, a pritom nije ni sam demokratski zabran i slično. Ključne probleme u tome što ljude se uvijek uhvati u trenutku i organizatori svjetskih događaja su uvijek korak ili dva ispred i zapravo zato bi trebao biti oprezan čovjek koliko sam shvatio jer se iza oba dvije strane krije uvijek isto a to isto je uvijek ono što do sad nisi vidio, nešto novo, nešto neočekivano. Primjerice, danas su jako popularni prosvjedi protiv Wall Streeta. I sad tu imamo jednu situaciju gdje čujemo prosvjednike kako govore moramo se ujediniti u globalnoj promjeni. Što zvuči upravo kao da se spominju nekakvi planovi o kojima ste sada govorili. Drugim ličima, kada čovjek već želi djelovati na ovom svijetu, trebao bi imati u vidu neki način da svoju vlastitu energiju zaštiti i da zapravo ne pomogne onom protiv koga se navodno e, buni. E, kako je vaše viđenje prosvjeda u Wall Streetu? Koliko je to autentično? Koliko je to i manipulirano? Je li unaprijed dogovoreno ili se pokušavaju ljudi naknadno instrumentalizirati? I zapravo čovjek očito preostaje samo da nikog ne zastupa i da ne dopušta nikom da govori u njegovo ime. Ali recimo da bi koraci u Wall Streetu bili još jedna Primjer taktike problema reakcije rješenja ako se može to tako opisati. Well, I was um, I was in the uh, Wall Street uh, protests um, not long ago, as we speak, about two weeks ago, when I spoke in New York, and um, I saw a lot of very very genuine people who had genuine, genuinely got to that point, and it's happening all around the world, where people were saying, I realize that I'm a slave and that I've been caught in a system of slavery thinking I was free. 
And they're beginning to see that, that the tiny few, in this, in this case, are bankers, um, are dictating to the lives of billions, right? So that's a good thing. But you're right. Um, <laughs> one of the main reasons that I've been doing what I have for the last 22 years is trying to communicate information so that people get streetwise to how the game's played. Because if we don't get streetwise to that, the game plays us. Um, and we can get in a situation where we're, we think we're challenging the game, but actually we're serving the game. And, you know, when we're talking about people's protests, of course, you can't really talk about Wall Street and Occupy protests without coming into the Middle East and North Africa. Because um, those protests have been massively and continue to be massively manipulated. Again, we come back to our friend, um, for want of a word, George Soros. Um, George Soros runs a, a network of organizations like the Open Society Institute and the International Crisis Group, which are specialists in manipulating people's revolutions, quote, to change regimes to give the impression that, that the people have spoken to change the regime, when actually um, the agent provocateurs and the people that, that triggered the initial protest, which brought lots of genuine people onto the streets, um, were trained and funded by his network and by the United States. And at the end of it, um, Soros's people, the, the Cabal's people, end up in power. And the, the classic is, well, the, of course, uh, the, the earlier than that, around Eastern, around, uh, Eastern Europe, um, we saw the uh, Ukraine Orange Revolution, we saw the Rose Revolution in Georgia, uh, at what have you, and they were manipulated by this Soros network. I mean, in some you know, journalists in the mainstream media in Georgia have said, yeah, it's, it's open knowledge that uh, Karkashvali or Karkrashvali, I should, call him, uh, really, because um, I think he's just a diabolical leader. Um, he was put into place uh, after the Rose Revolution, and he was educated in America and, and prepared in America. And so he's, Soros was doing it in Eastern Europe, it, and also in league with a man called Zbigniew Brzezinski, who was at one time Jimmy Carter's national security advisor. And together, Brzezinski and Soros are major, major manipulators, handlers, mentors, and in Soros's case, funder of Barack Obama. Um, so he's their man. And so if we come into uh, to Egypt, during the... Uh, the overthrow of Milosevic in, in the former Yugoslavia, uh, there, was, uh, there were groups uh, created uh, by a couple of uh, Serbians called Marovic and Popovic. I think Popovic. And um, one was called Canvas and one was called Otpor, which I, I understand means resistance. And these were organizations to train people in civil disobedience and the kind of thing we saw in uh, Egypt, the kind of thing we're seeing in Wall Street. Um, and uh, they were funded by the United States and, and, and the NATO operation. And after the end of that conflict, they continued to be funded. And they have openly admitted that they trained uh, key members of the initial triggering of the Egyptian revolution, the original one, um, in the art of, of doing that. It's also now been established that those people uh, that were behind the initial triggering of it um, had been um, working with the uh, US Embassy in Cairo for years. They'd been flown to America to, um, to, to meet people and have further training. And one of the key kind of groups uh, involved there was one called the... Um, April the 6th youth movement. Now, the, the, the Serbian guys admit that they trained uh, those people. And, of course, um, Otpor has this clenched fist logo, and therefore you had the clenched fist logo, fish, uh, logo of the um, April the 6th youth movement. And uh, Marovic turns up in Wall Street making a speech there uh, in the earlier time of the Wall Street um, occupation. Um, and then you look at 
a man who, when the, they started gathering in the square in Cairo, uh, this man got on a plane in Europe and suddenly had this revolutionary fervor um, and headed for Cairo. And this was uh, Mohammed El Baradi, who was uh, formerly the head of the UN Atomic, uh, International Atomic uh, Agency. And uh, he got off the plane in Cairo, and within days, he's one of the leaders of the revolution. And then he said he's going to stand for president when, when elections come and stuff like that. I, um, well, it just so happens that before he got on the plane, El Baradi was a board member of the international crisis group of George Soros and Sabigny Brzezinski that specializes in triggering people's revolutions and making sure their guy's in power at the end of it. I'm just hoping that uh, getting this information out and we're getting it out more and more about Baradi, that it will, uh, you know, throw a spanner in his works in terms of uh, becoming the leader that they want. And then you go to uh, Libya. I mean, the idea that that was a genuine revolution in Libya is outrageous when you look at the... Um, at the evidence. They were NATO agent provocateurs that were um, uh, funded and armed, not least through Qatar, the Emir of Qatar, who is, uh, does not represent the interests of, of Arab people. He represents the interests of NATO and that cabal that, that control NATO. And, and so you have this situation where one of the military leaders of the rebels in Libya was a man called Khalifa Hifta who for the previous 20 years had lived in Virginia down the road from CIA headquarters on their payroll. And, and, and what they're doing is using individual excuses like, oh, Gaddafi's doing these terrible things to this, oh, Assad, and all this stuff, to pick off country after country in a very systematic way. Because um, General Wesley Clark, who people in this area of the world will certainly remember, not a man I care for, I have to say, but um, he said in 2007, in an interview, um, which you can see on the internet, that um, a few days after 9-11, he was told um, by an officer in the Defence Department, um, that, um, in, the, in the, you know, the US military, that um, they were going to invade Iraq. This is, this, is not, this is not in 2003, when they got round to it, they were going to invade Iraq. They, they were planning already just after 9-11. So um, Clark said in this interview that 10 days later, he met this officer again, and he says, what's, basically, what's the latest on invading Iraq? Well, it's worse than that, sir, he said. They, uh, and he showed him a memo from the Defence Department uh, which said they were going to um, take over um, and invade seven countries in five years. And these countries, they were going to start with Iraq, then they were going to go Libya, they were going to go Syria, they were going to go Iran, they were going to go Somalia, and, and on it goes. Um, so what we're seeing now, as with the European Union story, is not something where these people are reacting to events. They're following a script. And the idea of the script in terms of North Africa and um, the Middle East, is to lead us into World War III. You know, I, I did an interview, uh, a, a video interview, when I came to Croatia, it was the last time or the time before, but maybe 2009, in which I was talking about the plan for the, the Third World War, because they've always, they've always planned three. Um, because if you look at a war, especially a world war, whenever there's a war, at the end of it, that society's changed. If it's a world war, the global society's changed. Look at, look at um, what the world was like after World War II compared with, with, with before. Not least, there was uh, f far fewer people in control of it. And then you go to the Second World War, exactly the same thing happened, m greater centralisation of power. The world was redrawn in so many ways. And the idea is to have the Third World War, and that is, as I've been saying for years and years and years, is to bring what we call now NATO countries, Europe and North America, um, into conflict with Russia and China. And uh, as we sit here now, we're watching these uh, pieces being moved into place so blatantly. Um, that there's, there's this constant bloody obsession 
with with invading or bombing Iran, generated by, by, by out of Israel overwhelmingly, and with you know America in its slipstream, and. They're picking off these countries uh, one after the other. They're desperate to do the same to Syria that they've done to Libya. Um, and if they do, and, and, and also they are drone bombing these unmanned drone aircraft, which are actually flown from a, by joysticks on the other side of the world at the Creech Air Force Base near Las Vegas. And they're killing uh, increasing numbers of civilians in Pakistan. And we've seen, of course, very recently, nearly 30 Pakistan uh, soldiers uh, killed by these, these drones. And NATO, uh, na na uh, NATO, and NATO come along, the leader comes along and says, oh, sorry, it was an accident. And as the Pakistan authorities have said, you were doing it for two hours. That's not an accident. And, and it wasn't. It's, it's upping the ante. It's, it's pushing the pressure because we've already got a situation now where China is saying, mess with Pakistan and you mess with us. They've said, in effect, mess with Iran and you mess with us. As, we, as we're sitting here talking, um, Russia has deployed warships to a Syrian uh, port in response to what's going on there. And then, um, just a, a, a couple of weeks ago, uh, and um, announced that there were going to be a permanent uh, troop um, uh, a presence in, in American troops in Australia. And he made the point that the focus of American foreign policy was now going to be Asia and the Pacific. And then you've got Sabignu Brzezinski, um, who is such an insider that if you read his books, he's telling you what's going to happen. I mean, you read his book uh, from uh, books from, uh, you know, 30, 40 years ago, and you'll see the world we live in today. But what he talks about in his books is the need to control an area of the world he calls Eurasia. And for people that can come across that term, it's basically Europe across to China and up to Russia and down to the Middle East. This is the very area of the world that all the focus is going on now. Because Brzezinski says you control Eurasia, you control the world. And what's right in there in the middle of that? Iran. And, and so we're seeing this script unfold. And unless it is, there is intervention by, by, by the people, then um, it, it, will, it will unfold. And what we are seeing in terms of the occupation protests around, around the world um, is the, the first stirring of people who are now understanding the world's not like they thought it was. They don't understand, most of them anyway, how it really is, but they know that the world's not the, the place they thought it was in terms of um, the world they lived in. They're starting to realize that actually a tiny few people, what, I mean, this is where the 99%, 1% comes from, are actually dominating world events and dictating increasingly the fine detail of people's lives. They are deciding if they have a livelihood or not. They're deciding if they have a no home or not and all the rest of it. And so we're getting this stirring of, I've had enough but what we need to do, which is why I'm working so hard to get this stuff out, is that we need to understand the game we're dealing with, where it wants to take us and the methods it uses to take us there. Because if we don't, then you can get a situation where protest from genuine people is demanding what the cabal wants anyway. Because what we're seeing in Europe with the European Union um, Ironically, I mean, you know, the irony is not lost, is that we have got into this mess by the centralization of power. We got into this mess by having the single currency. We've got into this mess by centralizing power in Brussels, dictating to all, all these countries. And what are they doing now? They're saying the solution to that, those problems caused by centralization of power is even more centralization of power. And it's important on, on the global level to get over this point. I, I am absolutely vehemently opposed to the abuses and the arrogance of corporations and banks and all the rest of it. But 
when people talk about we must do this, we must get rid of the banks, we must get rid of the corporations, or we must bring them under control, we've got to be very calm and ask, OK, yes, I agree with all that, but how is that done? Because the corporations, mega as they are now in biotech and pharmaceuticals and oil and banking and food production and all the rest of it, and, and uh, you know, like I say, powerful as the banks are, that is still a stepping stone. This cabal has not brought this situation about of domination by corporations, domination by, by private banks as an end in itself. It's still a stepping stone because what they want is the world government and then they want world government ministries, just like George Orwell talked about in 1984, because he, he, he wasn't coming from his imagination. He got access to the projected agenda through something called the Fabian Society in Britain. Um, and so they want a world ministry of food. That ministry would absorb all the food corporations and would dictate the global food chain in its entirety, no private corporations. Just that would dictate everywhere. You'd have a ministry of food in department in, um, in Croatia, and that would dictate on behalf of the ministry, global ministry of food, food, food policy in Croatia. And you can forget about organic food. You can forget about any food that, 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 that is nutritious, because they don't want that. This is, the, you know, you think McDonald's is bad. Well, you, you let this ministry of food get, get, get going. And, and they want genetically modified food because that genetically modifies us for other agendas that they have. They want a world ministry of oil that would take over all the oil corporations and it would become a like, like, a, like, a, like a communist situation where the government dictated all the, the, the oil infrastructure and everything. Uh, they want a world ministry of, 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 of what they would call health that would, that would absorb all the pharmaceutical uh, corporations. And so it, so it goes on, a biotech, a ministry of, of biotech, which would take over Monsanto and all these things. The same people that were running and controlling the corporations would now <laughs> be running these ministries. And just give them even more power. So where I'm going with this is if in the Occupy protests, people say, yeah, we, 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 we've got to nationalise and take over all these corporations. Yeah, that's what we... Well, that's what they want. So we have to be streetwise about it. And in, in terms of how do we respond to this? Well, in, in terms of, of the way we live our lives and how we, 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 we structure society... A lot less structure would be great, thank you very much. Um, it, it's a simple thing. When you're faced with a problem, you can find a solution to it, and we're drowning in them, or you can remove the cause of the problem. And that's always the sensible thing to do. Um, you uh, look at how we've got into this situation of mass human control. And it's through the incessant centralization of decision making in all areas of our lives. And the answer to that is not more centralization, which is what they're trying to sell us. It's diversity of decision making. So the people of Croatia decide what happens in Croatia. And then diversify it a bit more and let the regions of Croatia within that structure also have massive devolved powers to decide what happens in their community. We should be having a situation where those making decisions over our lives actually are affected by those decisions, because the decisions tend to be better. We need situations where we can look in the eye the people who are making decisions about our lives. When you have people in, in dark suits in Brussels, could they care, care about Croatia? Couldn't care less. They're never going to live here. What happens in Croatia is never going to affect them. So therefore, the decisions they make with regard to Croatia, uh, 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 they, they have no, uh, uh, th there's nothing in it for them. So they make the decisions that suit them, not Croatia. And that's the idea. And we need to be pulling power back from the centre uh, and, and, and breaking this incessant, this stampede that it is now for fewer and fewer people dictating to more and more and more. Radi se u stvari o manipuliranju opravdanim buntom. Ljudi su dakle ogorčeni zbog određenih stvari i potom se njihov bunt usmjerava u određene načine i te stvari doista nisu nevidljive 
možete otvoriti novine i vidjeti kako Putin stvara neku variaciju Europske unije, prepisuje njene zakone i sve zapravo upravo onako kao što se moglo čitati ili čuti prije par godina u vašim predavanjima i slično. Skrenuo bi ljudima pažnju da svake subote pišete newsletter, to su u stvari vrhunski novinski članci koji osvjetljavaju pozadinu svakih pojedinih, svakog pojedinog događaja koji se događa i mi ćemo u ovoj sljedećoj emisiji probati unatrag odvrtiti neke od njih zato se te priče naravno dijametralno razlikuju od onih iz novina. E, konkretno, uvijek postoji druga mogućnost. E, primjer Islanda govori sam za sebe. Možete li ukratko ispričati po čemu se Island toliko razlikuje od svega ostaloga, a što je ujedno i razlog, zašto ga više nema u vijestima? Well, Iceland um, is a very interesting story. Um, first of all, um, when Obama became Uh, president, he appointed a man in, in charge of his entire U- U.S. budget called Peter Orzag. Peter Orzag, um, before being given control of the entire budget of the United States, um, was involved in a company that was advising the Icelandic Central Bank in the run-up to the crash. Oh, my goodness, see, what should we do with Peter after all that? Ah, let's make him, uh, let's give him control over the budget of the United States. I mean, what a joke. Um, and and uh, the difference in Iceland, and it, it's a wonderful example, is the Icelandic people, when they were told that they were going to take the consequences for the banking uh, catastrophe caused by the banks, they said, we're not having it. We're not going to take the consequences for that. And, and Iceland took another direction in which they let the banks fail. And, and, and Iceland, therefore, was coming through this much, uh, with less, much less trauma than those who have um, bailed out the banks. Because what we've seen here, and, and Iceland shows that there is another way. Um, we have seen, since 2008, the biggest transfer of wealth from the population of the world to a tiny elite in known human history. And it's gone like this. First of all, I show, I show in, my, in detail in my books um, how um, it, the crash of 2008 was coldly calculated uh, to happen because people like Alan Greenspan, the uh, chairman of the Federal Reserve, the privately owned Central Bank of America, had through the end of Reagan Bush, through through Father Bush, through Clinton, and much of Boy Bush, um, was incessantly deleting checks and balance regulation to put some kind of uh, buffer on unfettered greed. And so by the time um, he left, I think it was about 2006, because he knew the crash was coming, he wanted out now. And he brings in this guy, Ben Bernanke, who's just his puppet and poodle anyway, from the background. And... Of course, the crash happened, and the crash happened because of the banking system. Now we have a banking crisis, but <clears throat> unlike Iceland, all the other countries, because their governments are controlled by the same people that control the banks, they turn the banking crisis into a government debt crisis by bailing out the banks. And then, after that's happened, With them in trouble, the IMF, controlled by the same people that control the governments and control the banking system, and the uh, European Central Bank, controlled by the same people, they come into the countries and say, well, we've got to bail you out now. Oh, and by the way, for us to do that, you've got to sell off your state assets to our corporations, controlled by the same people that control them, and also you've got to introduce horrific austerity programs uh, uh, hitting the most vulnerable people in society. And in this way, in what? A few years, 2008 to 2010, 11, there's this, this banking crisis has been transferred to become a people's crisis. Ireland's, Ireland is a wonderful example. Ireland did not go bankrupt without the bailouts because of the Irish economy. It went bankrupt because the ludicrous Irish government, led by a guy called Brian Cowens, who I wouldn't let loose on a garage sale, um, bailed out the banks that were failing to such an extent that the government went bankrupt. Um, and 
this is what has happened. And what we should be doing is letting the banks fall, letting them go. Too big to fail, watch me. Because what's the alternative? That that problem is um, transferred to the people. And, and what, what has happened as a result of that, this is really, really, really important if people just deep breath and look at this in, in, a, in, a, in a, a calm way. So Big New Brzezinski, in one of his books, talked about the coming uh, technocracy, where technocrats um, run the world and run countries, not elected, just technocrats, people like bankers and scientists and academics and, and experts in various fields. Um, he calls it the technotronic era. Um, and here we are now in Europe, and would anyone have believed this just a few months ago? We have a banker as Prime Minister of Italy, Mario Monti, who is the uh, European uh, president of the Trilateral Commission, one of these manipulating groups co-founded by Sir Big New Brzezinski. And he is um, a banker who's never seen a ballot box uh, in terms of putting him in a, in a position of power. And he's now Prime Minister of Italy with more than 60 million people and one of the biggest economies in Europe. And he's also in control of their finance. And what is he doing? Now, he's agreeing to all these austerity measures being imposed by the banks of the European Union. And then we have Luis uh, Papademos in Greece, another member of the Trilateral Commission, another professional banker who is Prime Minister of Greece, and he's never seen a ballot box either. So the technocrats are, in, are moving in. The society that uh, Brzezinski envisaged, he didn't envisage it, he knew it was coming. That's why he was wrote about it and was able to be so accurate. And it's coming in. So, uh, you know, I I've done quite a lot of research over the years and a, a good friend of mine has done even more on this specific uh, organisation. operates out of Britain but operates increasingly worldwide. And it's called Common Purpose. And what this organisation is, is a training organisation to train the leaders, all areas of, of society, local government, national government, police, all the rest of it. And that organisation in its training programmes actually talks about preparing the leaders for the post-industrial, post-democratic society. Because that's what they want and that's what we're seeing blatantly now in Italy and in uh, Greece. And how has that come about? It's come about because of problem, reaction, solution. And then another key area, of course, in terms of finance and financial control in the European Union is the European Central Bank, which was covertly set up in Frankfurt by the Rothschilds in their, in, in their historic fiefdom, Frankfurt. Um, and they've just appointed a guy called Mario Draghi as their uh, new head of the European Central Bank. What was he a, 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 a major executive of? Goldman Sachs. And Goldman Sachs is one of the prime centre of everything uh, banking operations that caused the crash of 2008. And we have a situation where um, after that crash in 2008, um, the uh, Treasury Secretary of um, America was a guy called Hank Paulson, boy Bush's Treasury Secretary in the last couple of years of his second term. And it was Hank Paulson that started this banking bailout, which then Obama picked up and went, you know, crazy with. Um, Hank Paulson joined the Bush administration from his previous job, chief executive officer and chairman of Goldman Sachs. And what's come out in the last, like, few days is that during the the, the initial aftermath of the initial crash of 2008 in September, he was telling Goldman Sachs and his mates what the policies were going to be. He told them that Lehman Brothers was not going to be saved and was going to go down. And Goldman Sachs was betting like a, a Las Vegas casino on all these decisions being uh, happening and all these ha things happening uh, in the financial uh, story of that time. 
are making a fortune out of it. And how, how could they do that? Because they knew that it was going to happen because Paulson was telling them. He's the Treasury Secretary. Um, what we're also seeing now, which is another thing to highlight, is that there are three credit ratings agencies called Moody, Standard & Poor's and Fitch Ratings that dominate 95% of the credit rating business in the world. These are the same credit ratings agencies that when the banks were, were building up all these toxic assets through all this criminal activity they were doing, um, these credit ratings agencies like Moody's were rating this toxic rubbish as AAA, which um, got people like pension funds to have the confidence to buy it and take it on. And of course, it, it's worthless and all the, these pension people, in, you know, pensions have been affected as a result. The poor people, again, the, the, the little people, as they call them. Um, and the consequences for the credit ratings agencies of doing that, zilch. Now, who is it that is credit rating countries like Greece and Italy and Spain and Portugal and Ireland... And when they downgrade their credit rating, causes economic uh, catastrophe in those countries. Moody's, Standard & Poor's, and Fitch Ratings. Uh, so when you control the ratings agencies, as they, this cabal does, you just get them to downgrade the credit rating of your target country, and the collapse starts. And there was an interesting point, uh, an interesting uh, story in, in August when someone was never named. If it wasn't George Soros, then, then I'd be desperately surprised or someone connected to him. Um, bet a billion dollars that the United States credit rating would be downgraded in a certain period of time. S staggering shock. It was. And he won his bet. Why? Because he knew the agencies were going to do it. Mm -hmm. This is how the whole thing stitched up. And, and there comes a point where, in the words of the song, freedom's just another word for nothing mm -hmm. left to lose. And we'll reach the point now where this system is so stitched up, it's so corrupt, it is so targeting the, the people of the world um, in, in such an uh, abusive way that we, we really have nothing left to lose. Because if we don't stand up now, it's just going to get worse and worse and worse. Hvala, Davide. Ovaj razgovor nastavit ćemo u idućoj emisiji. Tek smo na pola pregleda događa iz zadnjih, eto, pala i olav kao čok, od zadnjih godinu i nešto. Danas je, nažalost, došlo vrijeme za laku noć.